in D.C. We're just hoping that you listen. Welcome to District Divided, a D.C. sports podcast. This is the Washington Commanders offseason series, and today's focus is on general manager Martin Mayhew, who made a big move this week. He got Carson Wentz from the Indianapolis Colts and all $28 million that we owe him as well as their second round pick. And we gave them two third round picks with the one next year, potentially becoming a second round pick. If Carson Wentz plays 70% of snaps, and we also gave them our second round pick this year, we're going to discuss that move in a bit. We already have a video on that. So go ahead and check that one out. uh, If you're interested in a full emotional reaction from the two of us. Uh, But here we're going to talk about Martin Mayhew a little bit about his time as a player about his time as Detroit Lions general manager. And we're going to talk about last year's draft as well. Just sort of how he's doing. I am Mummoth. That is KDOT. KDOT, how are you doing today, sir? Man, it's a shit day, but I saw Batman yesterday and it's still... Um, it's keeping, keeping me going. going. Keeping you me going. Go. Oh my God. See, look, and we're in sync today. Keeping you going. It's keeping me keeping going on. too, by the way. There we loved, go. there we go. loved the Batman. Um, let's jump into it. Martin Mayhew, okay? First off, in case you didn't know, Commanders fans... He is a very big part of this franchise. He started opposite Daryl Green in a Super Bowl victory for us. Okay. So, and if you have seen the updated crest, 1991. The Super Bowl? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, but he's a Super Bowl champion with our franchise when we were known as the Washington Redskins. He spent three years as a player over here, and then he's bounced around the NFL as an executive. And he's gone to Detroit, San Francisco, Washington. His most notable time was with the Detroit Lions. So Matt Millen, who was a notoriously terrible general manager in Detroit, was there for quite some time. And Martin Mayhew in 2004 was an assistant general manager and officially got his shot September 2008, meaning the 2009 NFL draft was his very first draft. He would end up being their general manager through the 2015 NFL draft, beginning with his first ever pick as general manager, well, that would be Super Bowl winning quarterback, Matthew Stafford. And so that ended up being a great pick. It seemed like a no brainer at the time, but still you give him credit for not screwing it up. Right. K-Dot? I mean, like he still made yeah. the pick in yeah. Detroit. They were just waiting for him to draft another wide receiver. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. The number of wide receivers, Charles Rogers, Roy Williams, who he Martin Mayhew ends up trading. We're going to focus on the draft for now. We'll talk about some trades in a little bit that he did. Uh, Maybe a little bit of free agency as well. But that was 2009. So the rest of that draft, admittedly, not good. I'm going to read some of the names to you. You let me know if you even remember them. Okay. Uh, Well, Brandon Pettigrew, sort of a first round tight end. Yeah. Uh, Louis Delmas, DeAndre Levy, Derek Williams, Sammy Lee Hill, uh, Aaron Brown, Leiden Murtha, Zach Follett, Dan Gronkowski in 2009 in the seventh round. The next year, of course, Rob Gronkowski goes in the second round to the New England Patriots. So he was a year early on the Gronk train. Mm-hmm. That was 2009. Uh, 2010, he nails his next first round pick. It's in Dominican Sioux. Okay. Three time All Pro, five time Pro Bowler. Yes, he stamped on some heads, uh, but. Overall, great player. Okay. Super Bowl champion. Super Bowl champion. Another Super Bowl champion. So Martin Mayhew clearly had an eye for talent in those early rounds. And you're going to notice a trend. He was really, really good at building through the trenches, specifically the defensive line. Funny enough, because we already have a pretty strong defensive line, at least in terms Mm -hmm. of draft capital. Um, But he also addressed the offensive line as well. So in terms of fit, in terms of how people want to build their teams, I think Martin Mayhew is actually a really good guy for it. 2011, not a great draft. He took Nick Fairley, defensive tackle, who was fine for them for a little bit uh, in the first round out of Auburn, but not a whole lot to write home from there. Riley Reef was his first round pick in 2012. To hear Whitehead, fifth round pick, a linebacker. So terrific value over there. His I sold 20- him a home insurance policy once. Get the fuck out of here. Did you really? Tear Whitehead, yeah. Okay, well, random there fact. <laughs> it's a random fact. He was really good. He was really nice. He was really nice. And his uh, his girl was really nice, too. Okay, well, there you go. Shout out to here, Whitehead. Fifth round pick. <laughs> also got sold some insurance by our very own KDOT. Uh, 2013, I think, is the feather in Mayhew's cap. Okay, first round pick, Ezekiel Ansa. Terrific. Was a Pro yeah. Bowl player. Mm. Darius Slay, second round. That's an all pro in the second round. Terrific value. Third round pick, Larry Warford. Guard. 
let me tell you something about him. He ends up being a three-time pro bowler with the New Orleans Saints. Uh, many, many players that leave Detroit end up finding their good players <laughs> in different systems. Mm -hmm. But he actually received Offensive Rookie of the Year votes as a third-round guard that season. Okay? So those first three picks, home run. And then six-round pick, Theo Riddick. I know you all have heard of him. He's one of the scat backs, one of the best pass catching, receiving running backs the league has seen. Theo Riddick in the sixth round. I thought that was terrific value, Kate. That 2013 draft gives us a lot to be hopeful for moving forward shortly, right? Yeah. I mean, it shows the dude knows what he's doing. I mean, um, at least to a certain degree, he knows what he's doing. But you also got to remember um, he, he was in Detroit. <laughs> yeah. And I'm going to wrap up this laundry list of draft picks because I know this could be a bit mundane, but 2014, Eric Ebron, first, uh, first pick 10th overall for 10th overall, certainly expected more, but he ended up being a productive NFL player. So, I mean, in yeah. terms of identifying the talent, he had talent. He absolutely yeah. had talent. You yeah. know, um, also a similar build to Pettigrew six, five, six, six, like, you know, I just remember them being big boys. Yeah. They were yeah, big, exactly. they were big guys. So, so he has a type, if you will. Um, and then Kyle Van Noy in the second round, who is a terrific player, um, mm -hmm. still active, still moving around, um, I think with New England right now, or he just got cut. It was one or the other. Um, and then 2015, Lakin Tomlinson, a guard. OK, so you're seeing it. You're seeing a guard. You're seeing a tackle. You're seeing a defensive tackle, a two defensive tackles, Fairly End and Dominican Sue, defensive end mm -hmm. Ezekiel Ansa. Um, and he took Quandre Diggs in the sixth round. Uh, who has also been terrific. So those are his draft picks in Detroit. Um, a couple fun facts about him. So one, took the wrong Gronk a year early. Two, if he were to ever trade with Seattle, they're getting an all-pro in the middle of the draft. He made a trade with them and gave up a fifth-round pick to Seattle. That ends up being Cam Chancellor. Later, another trade with Seattle ends up giving a fourth-round pick that ends up being Richard Sherman. 50% of the Legion of Boom were Detroit Lion picks. So one could say he created the Legion of Boom. One could say Martin Mayhew is a co-founder of the Legion of Boom. So Martin Mayhew, I was pleasantly surprised, KDOT, as he is now our general manager. He's only had one draft with us so far. But I was pleasantly surprised because it is really, really hard to identify and draft talent. And yeah, he had one bad draft in 2011. But overall... He seems to know what he's doing. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. And I'd say I'd agree with you. I was a bit surprised by it, right? Like, yeah. we we hear about the Detroit Lions, and, like, especially those early years of the Az, they've had no success at all. I mean, they had the 2011 season, they go 10-6, and six, losing the wild card. But beyond that, it was nothing. And then you have the Jim Caldwell years for that bit where they were just – they were always a decent, hard-fighting team. Because you look at a lot of even the free agents that he would bring in um, that, that were all contributors. And – they, they they had a I mean in a division where you got the Green Bay Packers always dominating shit. Chicago usually has a defense that was doing something. And then Lord knows whatever the Minnesota Vikings were doing from time from time and time out, as long as they had Adrian Peterson and a defense that usually got the shit done. Fairly hard division and um or at least competitive division. Right. They like to beat up on each other. And they were always in the mix. Like they were seven and nine. Sometimes they go a little higher than that. They were always like right around there. And everybody knew those Colwell teams were gonna fight. Yeah. At least real hard. Yeah, exactly. So I, I think just looking at that, I began to feel a bit better. By the way, the Kyle Van Noy um, pick was actually acquired from Minnesota and he ends up making that pick. OK, so mm -hmm. he 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 knows what he's doing. I am encouraged, right, that sometimes you bring in a former player and it's just like, oh, well, he's a former player. This is supposed to be a feel good thing. I actually think this dude has some chops as a general manager, uh, at least in terms of the draft. Um, looking at our own. Right from last yep. season, Jamin Davis. I think the jury's still out. If you were to label it right now, yes, you would say it's a bust. You would. Uh, but again, you look at his size, it, it, it reminds me of those tight end picks, actually. The Brandon Pettigrew and uh, Eric Ebron ones. You see this prototypical size and speed, and you go, Oh my god, like we can make it work. That's where mm -hmm. he trusts the coaches, right? He trusts Ron Rivera, he trusts. Uh, Marty Herney's evaluation as well. We have an episode on him coming up as well. Um, and Jack Del Rio. So Jamin Davis, eh. Sam Cosby, I think is a terrific second round pick. Our first, like best second round pick in a really, really long time. We are notoriously terrible in the second round. Um, that looked good. 
Benjamin St. Just, I think, showed promise while he was healthy, and then he had the concussion, of course. Uh, Diame Brown did not have the season he was hoping for, did not have the season that we were all hoping for, but he also dealt with some injuries. Uh, John Bates looks great, though. I'm very excited good. for John Bates. He so he finally really gets good. that tight end right, sort of, in terms of value. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot to look forward to. And, of course, uh, K-Dot, I know you wanted to mention Shaka Tony. Yeah, William Bradley King, Shaka Tony, um, even Dax Milne, even though he was kind of annoying at certain points. <laughs> yeah. uh, but Shaka Tony is another dude that I, you you notice preseason throughout. There are certain guys that just catch your eye when they're on the field, like they're yeah. doing stuff, and you're just like, huh? Which is why I always like one name that I don't know why Washington fans seem to we've forgotten, like Junior Gallette. Every time he was on the field, I was like, why isn't he playing more? Like it was just <laughs> sort of like. Um, you, you just notice some things. And Shaka Tony's one of those guys that I just, every time he's on the field, he looks like he's doing something. And right. I, I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, Cameron Cheeseman, long snapper. He had himself a good year. I, I mean, so the point is these players are playing. And they are. Uh, they're getting experience. And we are building something. And so that is encouraging. Um, if we were to look at this, I, I can't get it out of my head. If we were to look more at this Carson Wentz deal. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. I just want to jump to it for a moment. Again, we are giving up a number of picks, and I was trying to make more sense of it, KDOT. So, because it leaves us really hamstrung, right? $28 million we owe mm-hmm. Carson Wentz, and then we can get out. Mm-hmm. I still can't tell if this is a bridge quarterback situation or if they genuinely think he's going to be the long term solution. Because I'm thinking about the first round pick. Do you think they can still go quarterback, or do you think? I don't know. I don't know. I'm still thinking. I don't, I just don't know. What are your thoughts? I think similar to what I said, we did the episode yesterday is that like, I think you could, I, I can understand if if, like, if if Malik Willis is there at 11, Mm -hmm. I totally understand taking him. I can totally, if they, if they love him, I get it. I I totally get it. But look, it's they're They're going all in for a guy. The only sense that I can make of it is that they're going all in for a guy who knows this is his last opportunity. And yeah. then maybe this will be enough to get him to play inspired this year because he knows if Carson Wentz does not get it right, he's not getting any other chances anywhere else. This is it. Yeah. And because, yeah. um, I mean, if you hear a lot of stories like that athletic article that you kept reading quotes out of uh, yesterday, I don't think people are going to look at that and be like, we want him in the locker room. So I think this is it. Like, this is literally it. And maybe that's enough to push him to 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 be the best that he could absolutely be. But they're going all in on this guy as a one-year lease, and then we kind of go from there. And it's – it's look, it's it's a bridge quarterback that could be something else. I think that's mm-hmm. the way to look at it. It's a bridge quarterback that they're hopeful that could potentially be something else. But if it isn't, hey, he's gone next year. Yeah. Um, they, that's the only thing is like – I. For a guy that we're just not entirely sure about, I don't know about this particular lease agreement, especially when it comes to, uh, you know, Landon Collins is now gone. And even though it was going to be a bit of a, a bit much to bring him back in here anyway, but I just, I, I hate what it did with the salary cap situation, especially when you had Jameis Winston, who was there sitting probably 10 million a year. I guess I'm, right. I, I guess I'm still trying to think about it from this episodes about Martin Mayhew. So I'm oh, thinking from about his, it from his perspective, right? So, Once again, he was hired January 2021. Okay, so he's only had the one draft with us. He was hired alongside Marty Herney, okay, who is the executive vice president of player personnel here. So they they all combined Ron Rivera, Marty Herney, Martin Mayhew all combined uh, for that 2021 NFL draft. They're going to do it again this year. And they make this move for Carson Wentz. And Martin Mayhew has made moves in the past. He traded for Haloti Nada. Um, which was a great move, you know, right after Indama and Sue left town to go to Miami on that five year, $114 million. Is he part deal. of the Jimmy G thing? Does he cross over? Is he in San Francisco when they make the Jimmy G move? Oh, that is a good question. I believe he does. Let I me, think that's, I think I'm going to double check, but I believe he does uh, cross pads. Yeah. 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020. He's there. Yeah. He's there. Got it. So he's there's, there. Then you, I mean, that's the thing is like right now, when I think about him is that we keep talking about his first draft, he gets Matt Stafford. And we know it's very public that we swang and we miss really, really hard at trying to get Matt Stafford last year. Mm -hmm. And now it's in the media that you failed there. Um, We hear you got the list of 42 quarterbacks of 32 teams, including some of the non-on teams. 
they took a swing at Patrick Mahomes, which I still don't know what that was. Um, they lose out on Russell Wilson. Aaron Rodgers was never really a, a thing. And it looks like they're afraid of the Deshaun Watson situation, even though we should be getting more news on the day that this episode drops. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I've tried to think about it from your standpoint, where you were saying yesterday is that like that maybe they feel as though they got a hot seat. Like they all need to make sure that they're getting something done right now. Otherwise Dan's going to clean house. Mm-hmm. I still don't think that's quite it. Cause I don't, I don't understand hitching your wagon to Carson Wentz to try to be your savior. Um, I just, I, I don't know what anybody can see. That well, so, the so how about this? How about this? Let's, let's talk about it from this perspective. Cause again, yesterday you and I are both going, what the hell was that? Uh, mm-hmm. After 24 hours have passed, I'm trying to be now more like now that I've gotten the anger out and vented uh, more cool and calculated about it. So like we said, one one of the issues we had is that no quarterback wants to come here, right? Mm -hmm. So Russell Wilson didn't want to come here. Deshaun Watson, there were rumors he might waive that no trade clause, but I think early indications were, no, he wasn't going to do that. Rogers, we knew didn't want to come here. Diana Rossini said so on local radio with Kevin Sheehan, who's great at his job. Absolutely. So that leads us to believe. Oh, and uh, Josh Taylor on Twitter, who is a rising college football um, reporter, analyst, what have you. He was at the Senior Bowl. He's got connections. Great follow. Uh, May even have him on the show uh, before the draft. He um, said that we apparently, uh, you know, inquired about Jimmy Garoppolo. So there's your Martin Mayhew connection. And Jimmy Mm -hmm. G didn't want to come here. So when you put all that together, it sounds like if we were to go for Jameis Winston, he may not come. If we were to go for Mitch Trubisky, he may not come. The rumor is the New York Giants. Mm-hmm. Uh, Carson Wentz maybe doesn't come. Maybe one of these guys has to because there are only so many starting jobs. But no, there's no guarantee. I, th- I think they were running up against the possibility, possibility, excuse me, that legitimately no one was going to come here. And so they end up overpaying. And I think they would tell you the same thing overpaying for Carson Wentz. What do you think right. about that? I, I think that there's 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 something to that. Because, I mean, even if you look, Amari Cooper turns down more money with us to go to Dallas, right? So right. there's like, there is a people don't want to come and play in Washington. And I, I know that the only way to change that is a winning culture. And it just so happens the economy needs some guys to sign with you in order to win. But uh, mm-hmm. it's, a, it's, a, it's a really shitty situation. But that, that might be what it is. They're just trying to save face. They know we need to upgrade the quarterback position. Anyone saying that, and I see it on Twitter every once in a while uh, over the last 24 hours, anyone saying Taylor Heineke is better than Carson Wentz, shut the fuck up. Just correct. stop. I just 100% stop. agree. And I love I Heineke. Love ta- I love Taylor, but that's just a ridiculous thing to say. It's just not true. Um, I think the more concerning stuff is just the, uh, I, look, Carson plays a lot of hero ball. He's not like, but he's also shown flashes of being a really, really good player. Um, like he just, I don't like hitching your wagon to this guy, but it's like, all right, if you know, you need to upgrade the quarterback position, you know, that at pick 11, if Malik Willis is there, it's not going to be starting quality. Mm-hmm. You look across the free agent, you know that, all right, the only way that we're going to make this work is if we trade for someone who doesn't have a no trade clause and they're forced to basically play. Right. If there's anybody that's forced to basically play and he's fighting for his career, it's Carson Wentz. Um, If he creates a stink in this, he's not going anywhere else. So he's got to kind of, he has to be the model citizen if he wants to continue playing in the league. So it might be one of those situations where they just look and be like, hey, we know you don't even want to be here, but fuck you. (laughs) You want your career to go any well? (laughs) You better come out here and you better perform. And they might even be saying like, look, we don't even necessarily want you past this year. But you need to be able to perform this year and put enough tape so that you can go somewhere else, or that at least that we can get enough out of the quarterback position. Because look, if we had to sit, I'm, I'm trying to think about it from a Washington fan perspective. Because I was talking to Brendan on the drive back over to Baltimore today, yeah, and I was saying that like it, it almost feels as though they try to satiate the fan base, and yet they don't know the fan base. Is yeah. is usually what oh, I that's feel. That's a good point because they did the same thing with the name reveal. <laughs> right. It's like, or yeah. when you have Jason Sean Taylor saying, stuff. we yeah. don't know that the fans wanted to come to Sean Taylor. It's like, you don't know who we are, do you? Like, it's just right. one of those. So I think that like, if, if we had come out of this off season after they had made such a big onus on, we want to make this big splash as far as quarterback and they walk away here completely empty handed. How do we feel as a fan base? 
Uh, Right. It's an excellent point. And I wonder if they knew, hey, this is becoming a very quick reality for us. I know Mm -hmm. when Russell Wilson, when that trade got announced, my heart sank because I was like, oh, my gosh, what are our options now? Um, you look at not only did they get announced, but we were willing to offer more. Like it's just to offer more. And I give the organization credit for that, that, Hey, we were willing to offer the maximum number. If that wouldn't matter, it it wouldn't matter. And you look at Seattle and Philadelphia at that point, right? Two different NFC teams that Houston would love, love to deal with, right? They can offer up to five first round picks. We can't do that. (laughs) We just can't. Um, if that rule is true, I was reading somewhere that you can only offer picks up to three NFL drafts in the future, meaning that we could only offer a maximum of three first round picks. If that's true, I need to double check that. But if that's true, well, then Philadelphia has three this year. They could literally just unload all three and two, you know, in 2023 and 2024, that's it. We can't compete with that. The story that I heard that makes the most sense to me was that, uh, Seattle had it in their minds. They did not want to trade Russ to an NFC team. Then the then the call started coming in. Washington was offering so much that they had to listen. Um, I heard that from what I understand, Philadelphia wasn't offering as much as Washington, but they were in the conversation. But because they weren't offering as much as Washington, they kind of disregarded Philadelphia. They, mm-hmm. What Philadelphia was offering was comparable to what Denver was offering for Russell Wilson. Except so they're in the it, NFC, not the AFC. Right. Okay. So it eliminates that. But because Washington was willing to offer so much, they had to then actually have the conversation with Russ. And when Russ says, yeah, I'm not going to go there, it ended it. But so there's like a multitude of things that led to the situation. Today. And it makes the most sense. I mean, that's another thing that we got to understand as far as these quarterbacks, right? Quarterbacks is the most high profile position on in, in the NFL or in, in professional sports, really, to a certain degree. Right. right. Um, imagine Russell Wilson, who cares about his brand, has Sierra there next to him having to answer on day one. So how do you feel about the owner who's writing your checks in the sexual? Like there's. Yeah. I understand there's a certain degree of like, hey, man, I don't even want to fuck with that. I don't want to deal with that. Like, let them kind of figure out that situation a couple of years. Like, like, right now, it's a little too hot for my brand to be attached to that brand. And I can get it. I can understand that. I don't fault anybody for it. I just it makes me more angry at the powers that be that we're here in this particular situation looking at it from the team perspective, because like I. It's starting to make more and more sense why the Carson Wentz thing happened as opposed to any of the other things, why we can't get free agents to sign here. Mm-hmm. We just can't. Um, at least free agents that are worth something. Um, it's just that shit, even free agents that are willing to come here, they don't really get good luck. Fitzpatrick. <laughs> like, it's just like the, the guys who do end up coming here don't necessarily have great luck, right? Alex so it's Smith like breaks his leg and it's like, oh, it might get amputated. Like, what the so heck? So it's like, if you look at that, they're, they're probably the players talk to each other and they're like, yeah, I'm not going there. And well, I don't blame, I don't, I can't blame them. I can be, be fr- frustrated as a fan. Be yeah, frustrated. Car- Carson Wentz better start meditating, I suppose, practice some mindfulness because he needs to be careful. <laughs> like you but said. That's why, but that's why I do believe that. I, I don't I do believe that Ron Rivera and them do have assurances that they're going to make it through five years. I, I do. I honestly do believe. That. I think if they had that, though, K-Dot, that they don't necessarily make this deal. I think, I think that, that, that they can then point to the Seattle League. We would have been mad as fans, but they could have pointed to that and said, hey, we offered three. We were in the Deshaun Watson thing for a while. Mm-hmm. And in the meanwhile, we lost out on some other quarterbacks. I don't think we would have been upset, but. We would have seen that the team tried and we would be better positioned for 2023. But I what would have been the alternative for 2023? But I, I, I get it. Hold on. You don't think we're in a better position for 2023? Well, the draft. I'm talking about the 2023 draft. Let me know. Oh, with this. Mo- what? Yeah. That's the thing is like, well, here's one thing our fan base is not going to be cool with sucking for draft picks for the sake of getting draft picks. I don't think our fan base is going to be all right with that. Yeah, but then you I, I just it. don't. Because, look, it, it, especially mm-hmm. if you, you look at our track record, what's to say that we're going to hit on whatever quarterback that we pick in whatever draft? Like, I just – I, I don't think you have an organization that's going to do that. I, I just don't – and I don't think us as fans, because we've used to 30 years of losing, are going to be okay with that. In pro Like, if sports, they fuck it up. Right. But in pro sports, there's nothing worse than being in between. Right? I, I, I get I, – I look, I understand that. Okay. But I'm saying that, like, if – this is – Trust me, I know I'm I'm working overtime to try to make sense of this, but it's what's the alternative that's out there of a guy who doesn't have to waive their trade clause, mm-hmm. 
that you can go and get. Because we can, like, let's assume that no free agents want to come here at the quarterback sure. position. None, mm-hmm. right? What's the alternative from a trade standpoint that we can pick up somebody who doesn't, who can't waive the no trade clause that we would accept? Yeah, so I guess it would probably mean bringing Kyle Allen back, assuming he was still interested in coming back and getting getting that caliber of quarterback, right? And we're rolling Taylor out again. It's, it's see, that's and the I thing. Think I don't think we would not want to roll. We are not going to do that. We're not going to do that. Well, I don't okay. think. I think there's a revolt there, right? Um, and I and here's the thing: is that uh, like when they did, and I know you disagree with it, but at the beginning when they said that we're going hardcore after quarterback, I think that was also a volley to the rest of the guys around the league that like, hey, we're going to take care of you. We want, we want whoever it is, we're going to go I get. See. We want you, right? Okay. And I think that that was and I, and look, Ron and them are taking a chance because if this shit goes wrong, they've tied themselves to it. I'm it's not sure they're getting five years. I'm not, especially because. So now let's talk about next season. But hey, hold on, one last thing. Sure. Oh, you're not got it, got it, because I do want to talk about next season. Yeah, right, right, right. So what what I was gonna say was, all right, well, I think it needs to work because now Ron has had two straight losing seasons, right? And if he were to have three, even though it would be Martin Mayhew's second season and mm-hmm. Marty Herney's second, if Ron goes, there's a very good chance these guys go too, right? So it's also important to them that there's no losing season this season. Got it. But here's this is the only thing. I, this is what me and Brandon talked about in the car right here. Sure. Or uh, when I was on the phone with him. We talk about being that in-between team, right? Yeah. If Ron Rivera has a worse record next year with the Washington full, with the Washington Commanders than he did have last year, I'm with you. Let's show him the door. Yeah. Under what circumstances do we think it is even remotely possible that we have a worse record than we had this year? It's low. Easier oh. schedule by far. Right. Carson wants a guy who can actually throw a football, right? Well, that's why they didn't chase you. So, the, so, the, so, I mean, I understand what you're saying as far as like they're, they're just doing it to try to get better. But I think that they have a five-year plan. They want to get better. It would be inexcusable to have a team show up with all the shit that happened last year. The mm-hmm. injury to your starting quarterback, the injury to your star on defense, the COVID stuff, the manslaughter thing. The fact that you had two other players that were witnesses to it. They, um, you, you have all these, the COVID, all that shit that happened last year. The worst possible stuff that could happen to this team. We were competitive. So right, right there at the end when the COVID fucking put us, put us out, put us out of misery, That is right? true. That is I just, true. This team was on a bit of a run. And then we were on a run. That happened. Like, yeah. I, I don't, I, I can't see, as much as I'm like shaky on Carson Wentz, he is an upgrade. And if COVID is not a thing, they're going to win more games than they did last year. If they don't, it's a failure. It's a massive failure. But what in the world would it take for this team to be worse next year than they are this year? Like, you got, I, I got to try hard to It'd think be a they're going to be worse. Injuries. It would, it would be It'd a have ton to be, of right? And to at that both point, Carson if, and Taylor also. And the, right. and the whole fucking squad. And if, they, and if that happens, if we get 70% of our team is decimated by injury, then Ron, Ron can the walk pass. into an office and he gets a pass, right? So I think right now, all he wants to do is finish with a better record than they did last year. And I think right now, nobody can be okay with it. We're middling around that seven wins. Oh, with there Taylor is a Heineke way, struggling. There, there is a way Ron loses his job. That's if what? Carson plays like shit. Okay, like we're talking one to two interceptions a game. I know he only threw seven oh. last season. Oh, yeah. But, but, but yeah. that's the risk. But this is why that's I res- kind of respect it. Understood. Right. Is that he is basically saying, like, fuck it, let's go. He's he's putting it all out there that I'm going to have to coach this guy up in order to do it. Because if Carson, got, if they bench Carson Wentz non due to injury and Taylor Heineken has to start a game just due to play. This city will the city will explode. Yeah. <laughs> OK, yeah, it be it sports will. talk radio is going to go nuts. <laughs> like it's going to go nuts. I can already see the junkies. I can see EB fucking losing his shit. Right. I, oh, for I, sure. Like I. We would lose our shit. We would lose our shit. There would be a collective losing of shit. Yes. I, I don't I don't think Carson does that bad. I, I can't I can't I don't I think can't so either. That. I, I think I think Terry's the best receiver he's played with. Um, and that's with respect to Michael Pittman Jr., who I think is a monster. I just think that mm-hmm. highly of Terry. Um, so that surely helps. I think Logan mm-hmm. Thomas. Is a real big tight end. You saw that Mo Ali Cox had his moments last season when 
Carson Wentz was in Philly. It was the Zach Ertz show. Okay, so like this, this should be good, and Curtis Samuel should be back and healthy. Uh, though I don't trust his health, but if he is, then this is a really good group of skill players. Mm-hmm. Antonio Gibson as well. Um, now we may lose out on JD McKissick because we're now a bit more hamstrung. That that's rough. Cap, that in, is rough in the cap department. Landon Collins is going to be released. It's giving us six and a half million dollars of cap room. The one other, and here's the sort of, um, if you're an always sunny fan, the Pepe Silvio uh, sort of argument. It is a reach. It is an absolute reach. I'm Charlie in the mail room. I've got the fins everywhere and the string. I wonder if people think that we have quarterback solved and it prevents a team like the Pittsburgh Steelers from moving up in front of us. And we do love Malik Willis. Right. So that way we go, oh, we got Carson. We're not taking quarterback. Bang, take quarterback. You know, I, I, it's something. But then you wonder, well, why wouldn't we just trade up uh, in the draft right now? But where do you trade up? And that gets interesting. So I don't know. Maybe that is the biggest reach I can think of. But it's very entertaining to think about. The Maybe thing is that you, and this is a really, really weird way of getting him. But, but we also have to look. We're getting to this point, Pepe Silva. To, to, we're yeah. getting to this point where it's if we're going with the assumption that no one wants to come here. No one's going to waive a trade clause. No right. free agents are going to want to come here. You know where they will go? Pittsburgh. Will. So. We get Carson Wentz. Nobody else was at risk of getting Carson Wentz, right? Unless, like we were saying, or like somebody, if Carson hits free agency because Detroit cuts him, and Indy. somebody else is sniffing around, or right. sorry, any, any, if somebody's sniffing around and he's like, I'm not going to Washington. Where are we at? Where, where are we at? Where are, we, are we mortgaging everything to go get Malik Willis because we're so worried about everybody else? And are we going to accept that as a fan base? Yeah. They, they, they traded all of the drafts not to go get Malik? I really, the more and more I think about it, the more I'm like, our situation is such shit that this might have been the absolute best alternative. And it sucks to that think sucks that. sucks to say. Right, right. Um, shout out Dan Snyder. Yeah. Right? Because it's, not, that's, that's it's him. It it's is. on him. And so I'm really glad we're doing this Commander's Offseason series because... I hope that, you know, if you guys have been with us for the, you know, building of an NFL franchise philosophy, the Dan Snyder episode that you were seeing and the Jason Wright episode that you're seeing how things are all connected, right? Mm -hmm. This is affecting Martin Mayhew's ability to do his job. I think we overpaid for Carson Wentz personally. If we had a better culture, maybe you don't have to pay this. Maybe you don't need to go out to the media and say, we're looking. Right. Because they were screaming that from every rooftop they could find. We are looking. We are active. We leaked. We leaked, by the way, the three first round Seattle. It's not Seattle saying, oh, by the way, the commanders, look at them. They're trying. No, it was us. Mm -hmm. We told the media we threw out three firsts for him. So it probably pisses Dan off. Yeah, this is embarrassing. It is embarrassing. It is embarrassing. Fucking embarrassing. it, It starts at the top. And everything trickles down all the stuff right. that we talked about. Which is what we talk about, like people that stick around this organization don't get that stank on them, right? Look, we look, we just went through Martin Mayhew's history. The dude has the abilities. Mm-hmm. What are we doing to help him? Ron Rivera is a guy who has the ability to coach. What are we going to do to help him? Is an organization. Start from the top, right? This is where we have to look at as far as all these pieces mattering. Because I think that if I can look at these guys, I'm saying that they are fighting a battle on all sides, trying to make this team better. And I feel for them. I feel for a lot of guys in that front office just trying to make shit happen. When you're dealing with an organization that just has so much stank that nobody wants to fuck with it. So unless you're going to build strictly through the draft in a weak-ass quarterback class, how are you going to build through free agency? You're going to overpay for another landing Collins? Like, yeah. what are you going to do? Are you going to have to get over the hill, guys, and pay them too much? So I guess now that we think about it more, maybe the cap room didn't even do anything, right? Because no one would want to come. It Not just, right? Because when you have a really, really good QB, uh, I'm not talking about Carson Wentz. Not mm-hmm. yet. Maybe he balls out, and maybe we do have a really, really good QB. Who knows? That's the best case scenario. And oh, by the way, if he were to play really well, the cap numbers for 2023 and 2024, because he has three years left on his deal, 26.8 million, 27.2 million terrific in today's market okay so this yep. could end up being a master a steal right so be. like it could that's the be. 
if we're looking at all the thing, all the pieces, this makes more sense. It's right. not great because no. of the situation. We're, we're still in, we're in a shit in situation. Yeah. We are in a shit situation, but they are trying to shine shit in the diamonds. Like, this is what we're trying to do at this particular point. Like, we all are guilty of it. We see that long list of free agents. Man, I, I know we're all good. I want Bobby Wagner. I want Tyron Matthew. There's nothing Sandy's motherfuckers going to want to sign here. Not a thing. Nothing. And if we're going based off the of history, people don't sign here. The Amari Cooper thing got overlooked. That was fucking embarrassing. That was embarrassing. I will take a pay cut to go to Dallas, even though there's no taxes, so I understand it to a certain degree. But I will take a pay cut to not have to go play there. That's the that's the vibe. And that's what you hear from people. You hear that around the league, like, hey, I ain't going there. And you can he- see Ron Rivera and them, they're trying to change the culture, but there's there's that vibe. I don't want to go play in Washington. And you hear former players, they talk, and, and you hear interviews, and they even ask, hey, are there certain places you just know to avoid? And they all say yes. Mm-hmm. They all say yes. So uh, one final thing I wanted to bring up. So we, we started the episode with Martin Mayhew. His pedigree as a player, his pedigree as a general manager, which, again, KDOT and I were both pleasantly surprised to see how his drafts went in Detroit. We assumed Detroit. We were like, oh, God, this probably went horribly. No, it actually went surprisingly well. It is hard to find good talent that can stick around in the NFL. And he did a pretty good job of that. So we started the episode with that. We moved over to Carson Wentz talking about, hey, maybe this is the absolute best they can do. Then transition to Dan Snyder, of course, and just this affects everything. Um, I wanted to quickly just touch on, though, that it was still a terrific deal for the Colts. I mean, oh, yeah. a terrific deal because now they have $71 million in cap space, by far the most in the NFL. We were talking about Amari Cooper. We were talking about Bobby Wagner. Their current roster, I think, is, you could argue, close to a quarterback away. So if they are, they're literally a quarterback away, there you go. So they have the running game. They have a solid defense. They have that stuff. So if they do get that quarterback very quickly, whether it be Jimmy, whether it be Jameis, whether it be Mariota, who would honestly fit pretty well with them, Mm -hmm. uh, Mitch, if they get that guy and they feel good personally, I think Jameis would be terrific for them. Well, then guess what? Maybe Amari Cooper does want to go there and they have the money to do it. Bobby Wagner wants to go there and they have the money to do it. Tyra Matthew wants to go there and they have the money to do it. The Colts, I, I know we're talking about the Washington stuff and we're trying to spin it more positively now and going, okay, you know what? Maybe we had to do this. Don't get it twisted. The Colts, big, big winners here in terms of what they're capable of doing this offseason. I, it, I said it on the episode of the emergency pod. The Colts and Washington are basically in the same boat. Here's the difference. They don't have the stank. They don't have the stank. So we we what we need to do is basically live vicariously through Indianapolis. And this is what would happen if you don't have Dan Snyder in that stank. They'll they're be going to be able to team. Yeah. <laughs> right. Pretty much. Like they're yeah. they're going to do what it is that we we thought this offseason was going to be. But because that stank exists, because look, that shit doesn't happen in a vacuum. The Beth Wilkinson nonsense, the the new accusation not that does not happen in a vacuum. And the fact is, that, it, and, and the thing is, even with the front offices, we've talked and we're going to talk more. When you have the fuck ups that look, love Jason Wright, and I'm sure there's a lot of pressure under when you fuck up on the uh, on the shield, when you fuck up on the name thing, when you fuck up on the uh, the Sean Taylor uh, ceremony, players talk. It does not make us a good look. You have to be on point. You have to be on point. Have to be on point. And so just before we wrap up this episode, I do want to ask you, KDOT, real quick. I'm going to quickly run through the opponents for 2022, and I'm going to ask you, are we a playoff team? Okay. So we have, of course, the Eagles twice. Now that will be, just from a fan perspective, very fun. Carson Wentz, now an NFC East QB again, going against his old team. I can almost guarantee you that's going to be the Sunday night game, opening weekend, or a primetime game in the first two weeks. Um, So we got the Eagles twice, Cowboys twice, Giants twice. And here's, we're playing the AFC South, so he's going to play the Colts. (laughs) It's going to be the Carson Wentz revenge tour. Um, We're playing the Texans, the Jaguars, the Titans, playing the Atlanta Falcons. We're playing the NFC North, Packers, Vikings, Bears, Lions. um, And we're playing the Cleveland Browns as well. 
Um, what do you think? Playoff yeah. team. Yeah, but I, I like, yes, yes. But I, I thought that we were a playoff team last year. Like, I yes, we have the talent to be a playoff team. And now that we have somebody who can throw a football, yes, I feel the same way I kind of felt about Ryan Fitzpatrick. But it goes back to we have to figure out our identity on offense. And if we're going to put the ball in Carson Wentz to lead us to victory, we're probably not going to have that happen the uh, majority of the time this year. Yeah, But put the ball in the playmaker's hands, and as long as he can do that, we're always going to have a shot. Yeah, yeah. I think he could learn a thing or two from Taylor Heineke, too, because mm-hmm. you could see that Heineke was learning to check down a bit. And they were yep. almost frustrated at how much he was checking down. And then he started throwing deep. And then we had mm-hmm. problems. It's going to be about moderation with Carson Wentz and finding that striking that balance, establishing that flow for himself. Um, and again, at the end of the day, we're Washington Commanders fans and we just want this to work. Um, so we had a bit more of a positive spin today. Uh, but this was the episode of Martin Mayhew, the Carson Wentz deal, uh, you know, upon reflection. Um, and this is District Divided, a DC Sports podcast. Thank you guys for listening. I am Amit. That is KDOT. Our next episode is going to be about Marty Herney. We're going to get into his sort of general manager time uh, and tenure over with the Carolina Panthers. He's got a connection with Ron Rivera. So we'll get into that. Um, and let's see how the, let's see how the off season progresses because the league year starts on Monday. So we're going to have some information for you guys on moves we've made. All right. But until then, take it easy. We'll see you next week. Positive spin. It's still depressing. It's still extremely depressing. Don't get it twisted. Take your Xanax people. We're just doing our best. We all are.